Welcome back. We're going to talk about a documentary about a fellow from the early 1900s who many times we might want to make a comparison to a modern media figure, but as we discussed before we came on camera, I think that any modern media figure might pale in comparison to the subject of nuts. John <laughs> Romulus Brinkley, I'm here with the director, filmmaker, Penny Lane. Welcome, good morning. Thank you. <laughs> Is that fair to say maybe even any obvious name from our headlines today, mm -hmm. I'm not going to mention any <laughs> names, but might might not quite measure up as a fantastical story as this fellow. Yeah, I can't think of anyone today who has quite the color and the drama and the reach of John Brinkley. Yeah, no, he's one of a kind. And for just a little bit of background, mm -hmm. Dr. air quotes, <laughs> Brinkley, pioneered a procedure that of course now we can obviously see was a charlatan's ruse, but he literally got men to allow goat testicles to be implanted in them so that they could once again be fertile. <laughs> yes, I like the way you put that. <laughs> he got men to do that. Yeah, so he, he basically announced to the world in 1917 that he had discovered a miracle cure and that um, if I put goat testicles into your scrotum, <laughs> you will no longer be impotent. Um, and it, wor it worked. I mean, he had tens of thousands of men have this surgery. Um, he built a huge empire, um, made a ton of money, and uh, that was, that's kind of the beginning of the story. And I liked a comment that you made in, in one of the articles that I read getting ready for our conversation about the fact that in some ways it sounded to me like this fellow may have just kind of had an aha moment and went, okay, there, here's a thing that I can make a bunch of money with, but he was far from only being a goat testicle doctor. He had a lot of other entrepreneurial things that he did. Talk about that vision and foresight that you discovered oh, through yeah. the process. So yeah, he had this brilliant idea in 1917, which is sort of the impetus of the story and like where his journey begins. But you know, soon thereafter, he builds one of the first radio stations in the country, he quickly became the most popular radio station in the country. He kind of introduced America to country music. He invented junk mail. He basically invented the infomercial as we know it now. Um, um, he was always kind of coming up with these brilliant ideas and he was an inventor and an entrepreneur and today we'd call him uh, maybe a disruptor. You know? Right, right, right. Um, he would but, be a main speaker at TechCrunch, yeah, right? Yeah, exactly. He might be. Um, he was really full of brilliant ideas and then he also was kind of, he became a politician. He ran for governor of Kansas. He won sort of, uh, and it, a lot of kind of just like really kind of his life is a series of adventures where his enemies, which are, you know, the government and regulators and I don't know, um, educated people who thought what he was doing was a scam, uh, <laughs> he always kind of was able to get around them. Like he has kind of that um, sort of ability to say like, oh, you're going to try to stop me this way, I'm just going to go around you this way. And that's kind of the fun of the story, is watching him just outsmart his enemies over and over again. And it feels like that's kind of his dominant characteristic in terms of how he was able to accomplish these many different things and have so much influence was that I'm, I, I'm sure that if we were sitting here with him, we would be spellbound and we totally. would be right into, totally. into his world, literally. Absolutely, He's, he was so seductive, he was so convincing, um, and the film really tries to honor that. It doesn't, it doesn't say, the film is not about like, let's make fun of the dum-dums that fell for this guy, uh, uh, right. you know, with the benefit of a hundred years hindsight. Sure. It's more like exploring how someone like that does what he does, how does he seduce you, how does he convince you? Like, and, and that's something that is relevant in a lot of different spheres. I mean, he was the master of it, but it's not like his techniques are unique. They're the techniques of every con man, right. every quack doctor, every, you know. But in the hands of a genius. In the hands of a genius and like maybe a sociopath. Right, right, right. <laughs> of course, you have to have a little sociopathy to pull off. Yeah. All the things that he did. Yeah. Talk a little bit, if you would, about the long and winding road mm. of <laughs> starting this film, yeah. being in production for a very long time, and 
accomplishing <laughs> completing the film and now being at Sundance. So congratulations. Thank you. It's pretty great. Um, I started the film eight years ago, and wow. when I came across Brinkley's story, I thought this movie, this story was made for the movies. Like it's such an amazing Holly, like Hollywood story in a sense. Um, it's got this amazing drama and color and this brilliant arc of kind of tragedy where he starts from nothing and rises to the top and Returns. spoiler kind of falls down at the end again. Um, but yeah, so figuring out that the story was great was only the beginning of the process and then um, it took about two, three years of research just to kind of go and find materials and track him down in a sense from the historical record and it just was a long process. I mean many independent films take a long time. Um, so about eight years later we're at Sundance and in the middle I did make a whole other feature film so it wasn't like I was It wasn't just like you were just <laughs> sitting with this one project Yeah, no, only. my other film was about Richard Nixon. Our Nixon. So, yes, our Nixon. So it had this, it was interesting to kind of have these two characters that I was hanging out with for so long. No question and, and without trying to get into a deep psychological analysis, uh, what an interesting comparison in terms of how much we, many of us anyway, if we're old enough, <laughs> Remember the the feeling of of a very powerful fellow, dark side of the force maybe in Richard Nixon, but absolutely an no. They both they fellow. actually have very similar American kind of 20th century American tragic Journey. lives, right? Where they both are men who are brilliant and very flawed, and you know really their own flaws bring them down in the end. So that kind of makes both of their stories these kind of classic tragedies, you know, these kind of classical tragedies, and that for me is very appealing. They're pretty similar, actually. <laughs> <laughs> the more we talk, the more similar yeah, they get. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so uh, let's take a look at a piece of this film because the animation and, and just the general feel, I, I think initially, uh, of course, there's a chuckle and a smile to it, but also belie this darker underside. Let's take a look, shall we? Nuts. We're nuts for nuts. <laughs> talk about about the animation, about about tone, because I, I I can't help but feel the sort of the dark underside, and yet there is a, a pulling of the storyline through the animation and through the lightheartedness of it. Yeah, well. I mean it's a funny movie. Like there's it, it, you know it's it's about <laughs> what it's about, um, but it's not a comedy actually. Like I said right. before, it's actually right. a tragedy. Yes. So there's tons of humor, and that's part of what makes it so fun. But it's not like a, a joke in the end, you know. Right. Right. Um, and the animation came about because you know there was only so much archival of John Brinkley that I could work with, and the archival is amazing, um, and there's tons of it in the film. But it doesn't it doesn't convey how convincing and seductive and incredible and interesting he was. So scripted reenactments came into play pretty early in the process. And then I had this idea that the film would have seven chapters um, and that a different animator, a different artist would illustrate and animate each chapter. And that allowed me to do a few things. One was um, kind of keep it interesting, like, you know, bring the, the idea of the film being kind of nuts. Right, right. Yeah, yeah, there's a little bit I of chaos to having be, lots of different animation styles. I just wanted styles. it to be like over the top in every way. So like, why not have seven different animators? And then <laughs> also it allows me to kind of revisit key scenes throughout the film. And as we redraw them, you know, we see them in different ways. So sure. it lets me kind of play with the idea of like what is truth and what is fiction in the story. And the benefit perhaps of an eight year production cycle that you really get to live with the story and live with the process to the point where maybe you clarify your vision and see it more clearly. Oh, absolutely. I mean, this this film is not a film. Sometimes when you run off to a film festival, you're sort of not sure what you made yet because right. you've just been editing until sure, like midnight, sure. the night before your premiere. You I know. Mean, that happens. But this has been a very slow and deliberate process. This film is really clearly what I set out to make. I'm really proud of it. And as well you should be, congratulations. Thank you. I'd love to talk more. I know you have a very busy social schedule here. <laughs> and. We're going to let you go. Tell folks where they can find out more about the film online. Oh, yeah. Uh, the website is nutsthefilm.com. We're on Facebook, Nuts the Film, Instagram, Nuts the Film. Yeah. Wonderful. Twitter, Nuts the Film. <laughs> you get it. Penny Lane, thank you so thank much. You. Great this to meet fun. you. Have a wonderful Sundance and best wishes for great success for this film. Thank you. And you're next. Thank you. Okay, you guys, we're going to get out of here and take a quick break. We'll be right back with more on In the Can. Thank you for watching.